course, uh, we're now going to go for our final keynote for our event, and this will focus on random access for machine-to-machine -machine communications, connection-based or connection-free. Now, with the new wave of digital revolution, wireless communication networks are experiencing a radical paradigm shift from the conventional human-to-human -human communications to machine-to-machine -machine communications to facilitate the massive access of machine-type devices. Random access is expected to play a crucial role in the next generation M2M -M communications. This talk will also highlight the practical implications of the analysis to the access design of M2M communications. And to tell us more, I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today. She's a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering of City University of Hong Kong. She has broad interests in communications and networking theory with special interests in wireless communications. She was a co-recipient of the Best Paper Award at the IEEE WCNC 2007 and the IEEE Marconi Prize Paper Award in 2009. She also received the President's Award of City University of Hong Kong in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Lin Dai. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. Now, let me share my screen first. Okay, um, hello everyone, I'm Lin Dai from City University of Hong Kong. Um, my great pleasure to share with you about my latest research uh, on machine-to-machine -machine communications. I guess one of the great benefits of being the last speaker is a very well-educated uh, audience. So we have heard machine-to-machine -machine communications for a couple of times in previous talks. Uh, we know it's important. Uh, it's going to play a crucial role in our future communication networks. And here in this talk, we are going to uh, take a closer look at its basic concepts uh, and the challenges it brings to our communication network designers. And we would focus on the multiple access level uh, more specifically, random access. So this is a field of long history um, with almost half a century. Um, it has been widely adopted to many different communication systems with numerous protocols developed. Uh, but in stark contrast to its successful applications, its theory has been long behind. And in this talk, we're going to see why it's so challenging to develop a good theory for random access despite all the simplicity in concept. And we would also specifically focus on the two basic types of random access, connection-based and connection-free, and see which one better suits the machine-to-machine -machine communications. All right, so this is what we are going to talk about in this talk. Uh, I'm going to start from the basic concepts of random access, machine-to-machine -machine communications, why they are important, and um, how to establish a unified theory for random access. And based on the theory, how we characterize the maximum effective throughput for connection-based random access and connection-free random access. And eventually, I'm going to conclude the talk by highlighting the implications of the analysis to machine-to-machine -to -machine communications. All right, now we start from the background. No doubt, we are experiencing a new wave of digital revolution. And one of the key driving forces is this vast array of machine-type devices. So here, yeah, machine type devices refer to those automated devices without human intervention, such as sensors. And nowadays, billions of sensors have been stored in our homes, cars, business, uh, city infrastructure. So it is predicted that by 2025, the number of machine type devices is going to be 10 times of our human population. And that is why two out of three services for 5G networks are devoted for machine-to-machine -machine communications. That's massive machine-type 
communications and uh, ultra reliable low latency communications, uh, which you have been uh, hearing a lot in the previous talks. So we have every reason to believe that this machine to machine communications is going to play an increasingly dominant role in our future communication networks. And to better understand this fundamental paradigm shift from our traditional human to human communications to machine to machine communications, let's see, first of all, how they are different from each other. Well, for traditional human to human communications, we use our handheld devices to browse the internet, share pictures, uh, watch videos. So the services are usually bandwidth hungry, but Usually we have a small number of users that are simultaneously served. And on the contrary, for machine to machine communications, the density of the machine type devices could be order of magnitude higher. 5G networks, for example, are supposed to support up to 1 million devices per square kilometer. But the good news is that without human intervention, the sensors are usually designed for specific purposes, for example, monitoring the environment, the electricity, the gas, so they do not have a lot of data to transmit. And now, a big question is, um, with all these unique features of machine-to-machine -machine communications, how to provide pervasive and efficient access for those machine-type devices based on networks that were originally designed for human-to-human -human communications? Well, to answer that question, we need to start from a more fundamental problem of all communication networks. Um, that is, if you are not the only user in the system and you have to share resources with others, then how to share? Yes, this is uh, what we call multiple access. Well, basically there are two ways to do it. Uh, if you have a central controller to collect information from the network, then it can uh, allocate resources to users. But if such a central controller is absent, then every user has to determine when and how to access in a distributed manner. We call it random access. So this centralized access has been long adopted in several networks, um, mainly for data transmissions. But usually it requires a lot of signaling to coordinate users' transmissions. And that would cause a significant system overhead when the number of users is large. And resolving the resources, on the other hand, would need to a huge waste of resources if users only transmit sporadically. And that is why for machine-to-machine -machine communications, the access has to be distributed. Well, random access has been widely used in current communication networks. For example, in our cellular networks, uh, this is what we do. Uh, the users with data to transmit would first send requests to the base station to initiate a connection. Just for example, in this forum, if you have questions to ask, then you can raise hand okay, first and indicate the host. And then the host or the base station would allocate the resources after successfully receiving a request to the user for data transmission. So this is a typical frame structure for um, several networks, like 4G or 5G. And users would send requests in this PRSH slots okay, or subframes, and all other subframes are reserved for data transmissions. And another representative uh, wireless network is Wi Fi network. It has two access mechanisms. For RTS, CTS access mechanism is quite similar to the Mac of Sour systems. So here again, users have to send a request first before they transmit uh, the data packets. And in another access mechanism, basic access is different. Okay? So every user would independently send their data packets. So it's like if you want to ask a question, you just unmute yourself and raise the question without getting consent from the host. So here, the common feature of this RTS-CTS access of Wi-Fi and the Mac of several networks is that the users would always send a request first okay, before their data transmission. Okay. So that means here the data packets they do not contend because 
uh, before they are transmitted, a connection with the base station um, is already established. And uh, we call it connection-based random access. And on the other hand, for this um, basic access of Wi-Fi networks, we can see that every data packet has to contend with others. And if they are failed here, then the time wasted in the failed transmission will be determined by the data packet names, which would be usually right, would be much larger than the names of a request. But uh, the benefit is that here the overhead is much smaller compared to the connection-based random access because you don't have to establish a connection first. All right, so we can see here there are two basic types of random access, connection-based and connection-free. Well, to determine which one is better, um, we have to evaluate whether it is worthwhile to establish a connection. It's like if you want to eat outside and to decide whether to make a reservation first. Well, if it's a fast food restaurant, then probably just go. But if it's a fancy high class restaurant, um, where people would spend two hours eating and talking, then you'd better make a phone call first because otherwise you may end up waiting for the whole night. So here, similarly, if you have a lot of data to transmit, then you'd better establish a connection first. Because the benefit um, of this reducing the transmission failure time would probably overweigh the cost of system overhead. So in two three, we have this critical threshold of the data packet transmission time, only above which establishing a connection would be beneficial. And once we have this critical threshold, we can address a lot of important issues. For example, for Wi-Fi networks, when should we activate this um, connection-based RTS-CTS access? And currently, we barely use it. Is that a right thing to do? And for 5G networks, um, its connection-based random access procedure has been long criticized uh, for its low efficiency. And many people have been advocating to replace it by a connection-free one. Is that a legitimate concern? And ultimately for future networks, should we use this connection-based random access or connection-free random access? And to answer that question, we first have to know how to characterize this critical threshold. And that requires a unified theory of random access. Okay. So here we take a closer look at some basic concepts of random access. Okay. We know that for random access, each node has to determine independently when and how to access. So for each node, it has to answer three questions. Very simple questions, when to start, when to end, and what if the transmission fails? Well, the first question, when to start, simple, you just transmit when you have data packets. And that's indeed our first random access protocol Aloha. But despite its simplicity, it may not be efficient because the ongoing transmissions may be frequently interrupted by the other transmissions. So a more polite solution is to sense first. So transmit only when you sense the channel idle. And that is called CSMA. But here, the basic assumption is that everyone can hear each other, can sense the channel correctly. And if they can't, then they have to, again, rely on the receiver. So they would send requests to the receiver and let the receiver notify them whether the channel is occupied. So that sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's indeed connection-based random access. All right, the second question, when to stop? Again, simple, you stop when you finish. Right? But sometimes you can stop earlier if you sense the other ongoing transmissions and know that yours is going to fail. Right? And that's exactly what nodes would do if they are capable of sensing during their transmissions. Right? But if they can't, which is common in wireless communication networks because uh, usually they cannot, um, uh, the receive signals will be overwhelmed by their own transmission, uh, transmitted signals. 
So in that case, they do not know whether the transmission is successful or not until the end of it. And to avoid wasting a lot of time in the failed transmissions, then again, they will send a short request to reserve the channel first before they start the data packet transmission. Right. So again, this is connection-based random access. But connection-based or connection-free, you always have transmission failures because users do not coordinate their transmissions. And here, the definition of transmission failure depends on what type of receivers you have. And as you can imagine, there are many, many different uh, receiver uh, designs. And one of the most widely adopted one is called the collision model. So here it's very simple. The packet transmission is successful only when there are no concurrent transmissions. Ah, but uh, you can see this is a pretty much simplified and often pessimistic assumption because the interference from other um, ongoing transmissions may not always ruin your transmission. So a more practical receiver model is called a capture model, is that a packet can be successful as long as it's received SNR is above a certain threshold. And of course, if you have more advanced receivers, then the transmission failures can be further reduced. And no matter what type of receiver you have, you always have transmission failures. And to resolve transmission failures, you back off. That means retransmit later on after a random amount of time. Well, basically, a backup scheme can be characterized by how this transmission probability is set. And a common practice is to set this transmission probability according to the number of transmission failures a packet has experienced. Well, intuitively, more transmission failures indicate that the whole network has a higher uh, contention level. So then to relieve it, the nodes should transmit less frequently. And um, the examples, typical examples include bio exponential backoff, while the transmission probability will be exponentially reduced according to how many trans transmission failures. Um, that is adopted in Wi-Fi networks and also uniform backoff adopted in cellular networks. So here we can see there are a lot of design freedoms um, when we design a random access network. It can be sensing free or sensing based. It can be connection based or connection free. You can have many different backoff schemes with all these different receiver models. So numerous random access protocols have been developed. And we also have many different ways to evaluate the performance. And for example, one of the most widely used one is the network throughput. So we know that without coordination, then users' transmissions, we collide with each other. And so the number of successfully decoded packets would vary with time. It it's becomes random. And the narrow throughput is the average number of successfully decoded packets uh, per time slot, which indeed also tells us the access efficiency. And we know every packet has, uh, it carries a certain amount of information. And in practice, what we care the most is how much information can be successfully delivered. And that is the network sum rate. And of course, we also care about um, how much delay uh, experienced by uh, each packet. With random access, we know that you may not always be able to transmit when you uh, want because you have to compete with others. Right? It may take a long time before your packet can be successfully delivered because you have to wait and retransmit. Okay. And another new information, uh, sorry, a uh, performance metric that has got a lot of in um, attention recently, uh, which was also mentioned uh, in previous talk, is this age of information. Uh, it describes how fresh the packets are, uh, which is determined by not only how the packets are transmitted, but also by how they are generated. Okay, so it's very closely related to the queuing delay performance of the packets, but um, normally you cannot optimize both of them simultaneously. You can uh, find many, many different performance metrics. Um, so to probably evaluate and even optimize the random access networks, you first of all have to probably model it. 
So as you can imagine, many different analytical models have been developed um, in the past half a century, um, but they are usually tailored for specific schemes to tackle different problems. And often, very often, those differences in the modeling assumptions would need to consist inconsistent results. So here we can see that basically the random access uh, or more essentially a multiple access in, uh, system can be regarded as a multi-queue single server system. So here to fully describe a multi-queue single server system, we need this joint stationary distribution of the queue nodes of all the nodes, which is, uh, as you can expect, intractable. Okay, for most of the cases. And the main challenge here is to characterize the coupled process, uh, uh, queuing processes of all the nodes. Okay? And they are coupled together because they share a single receiver. So many have resulted to um, a surrogate system called the dominant system. Well, the queues can be decoupled under some special condition, okay? but the difficulty still lies in how to properly set up the dominant system um, so that it can be analyzed and still statistically indistinguishable to the original system. And another approach which is widely adopted by the majority of the studies, uh, including most classical models that we have learned from the textbooks, is to only focus on the aggregate traffic of all the nodes okay, by either um, assuming that the nodes are bufferless okay, or assume that the node queues are saturated. That means they always have packets to transmit. So here we can see by ignoring the queues, okay, the, the analysis can be greatly simplified and it captures the essence of the contention from the old nodes. But in practice, uh, we do have queues okay, to store the incoming packets. Okay? And that would need to different performance okay, under a certain traffic input rate. So here, ideally, okay, we need a scalable analytical framework well, the modeling complexity does not increase with the network size because we have to deal with this massive access scenarios. And on the other hand, we also hope that this framework is unified, okay? not simplified, but unified so that all these different um, random access schemes can be analyzed based on the same framework, okay? regardless of what performance metrics are adopted. But how to do that? Right? The big question is how can we capture the interaction of the nodes right? without rendering the model unscalable? And to answer that question, let's look back to this multi queue single server system. So here we can see that all the nodes, right, they interact interact with each other only through their head of line packets. Okay. So in other words, here, the queues are coupled. Okay. The coupled queues are only determined by the behavior, the aggregate activities of their head of line packets. So here, the key is to first of all, monitor, uh, sorry, to model uh, the head of line packets behavior. And based on the head on package model, and we capture the interaction um, of all these different head on packets by establishing a fixed point questions of their steady state probability of success. So, in general, this head on packets behavior can be modeled as a discrete time Markov renewal process. Um, the state characterization is determined by whether the node sends the channel or not, right? Aloha or CSMA. And the holding time of these different states would be further determined by your protocol design. Okay? 
And here, the linchpin of the whole analysis is the steady state probability of success okay, of all the Hadron packets. And we know that um, whether a packet is successful or not is determined by you know, the aggregate activities of all the Hadron packets. So based on the limiting state distribution of this Hadron packets, then we can establish and solve the fixed point questions of um, their steady state probability of success in different conditions. Okay. And in various scenarios, we can obtain explicit expressions of their solutions. And then together with this head of packet model, we can fully characterize uh, the coupled service rates of the queues um, as functions of those key back off parameters. All right, so based on the proposed analytical framework, we can do a lot of things. Uh, we can characterize the fundamental performance limits, such as the maximum network throughput, minimum mean delay, uh, maximum network sum rates, and the corresponding optimal values of the backup parameters. So here, the backup parameters mean um, the transmission probability of each node um, or the backup window size. Okay. All right, and that offers a lot of uh, insights to our practical network design. And one of the examples is that here, you know, um, in existing transmission control strategies, the tuning of the backup parameters uh, is usually based on uh, fast tracking of some time varying network status. For example, you have to know how many nodes are backlogged or with busy queues or are transmitting. Okay. But that would cause a lot of system overhead on estimation and feedback. Okay. So here, um, our analysis suggests that, well, here you can do this optimal tuning solely based on the long-term traffic inputs. And you do not have to know those instantaneous network status. You only need to know the traffic inputs and how many nodes are totally in the network. All right, and we have successfully applied the theory to practical networks, uh, such as Wi-Fi and several networks. And this is a, a, a summary of our series of studies, uh, which you can find uh, in my homepage. And now let's take our um, focus back to the topic as the comparison of connection-based and um, connection-free random access. Okay. So the following discussions will be mainly focused on uh, based on uh, my two papers, okay? oh, sorry, which you can um, find all the details uh, online. Um, and that is why I'm going to skip uh, the details and only focus on the final results and the implications okay, of the analysis to the practical system design. All right, let's rewind a little bit. Okay? So we know that for this connection-free random access, every data packet has to compete with each other. Okay? But for connection-based random access, well, here you send a request first to reserve the channel. Okay. And here we focus on the network throughput. That is the average number of successfully decoded packets, okay. um, which is also the access efficiency. And to find out the maximum network throughput, this is what we do. We would push the total traffic input rate, okay, keep pushing it. Uh, and you will see that the network throughput would first increase with the traffic inputs, And then when the network is saturated, it will be only determined by the transmission probabilities of the nodes. Okay. And then you can further optimize, um, uh, maximize the throughput by optimally tuning the transmission probabilities. So these are the results. We can see that the maximum network throughput here is only determined by whether nodes sense the channel or not. Okay? And in both cases, they are determined by the successful transmission time and the failed transmission time. And here we can see that the successful transmission time and the failed transmission time would differ okay, in connection-free random access and the connection-based random access. And also the system overhead will be different in these two cases. And that is why um, we have to take the overhead into account 
when we evaluate the throughput performance of these two. And instead of looking at the maximum network throughput, we would focus on the maximum effective throughput. So that is what is the maximum fraction of time that is spent on the data, only on the data payload transmission. And here are the results um, for the connection-based ALOHA and the CSMA. Okay, so here we can see that they are closely determined by the data packet transmission time and the overhead time for successful transmission and for failed transmission. Okay. And for CSMA is further determined by this um, sensing time okay, because nodes have to sense the channel first. And these are the results for connection-based ALOHA and CSMA. All right, so now we can put everything together to compare their performance. We know that, well, um, for this overhead time in the successful transmission, then the connection-based one will be larger because it takes longer time to establish a connection. Okay? So that's the cost of connection establishment. But on the other hand, here, the transmission failure does not involve a data packet transmission. Okay? So the um, failure transmission time can be greatly reduced. And now if we plot uh, the maximum effective throughput, um, both ALOHA and the CSMA case, so this sorting line is um, with connection, okay, connection-based, and the dash line is connection-free. Okay. Then we can see that here, is in both cases, ALOHA and the CSMA, the throughput with connection-based uh, random access would succeed, right? or would, sorry, would exceed the connection-free one right? when the data packet transmission time is sufficiently large. That's pretty uh, what we have been expecting. Right? And here the crossing point right, is indeed the critical threshold uh, we have been trying to find. And we can um, derive the threshold for beneficial connection establishment as functions of all these overhead parameters in both ALOHA and the CSMA case. And we plot them here against the ratio okay, of the overhead time for a successful transmission in the connection-based case and in the connection free case. So here we can see that a larger ratio here indicates a higher cost of establishing a connection. Okay. So that means it takes longer time to establish a connection. Okay. And both the thresholds with or without sensing here would increase, okay, would increase with this ratio. Well, that's again, not surprising, pretty much what we have been expecting, right? Because, well, intuitively uh, you need a larger data packet transmission time um, for this connection-based random access to outperform uh, the packet-based uh, random access. Okay? So that's not surprising. But what is interesting here is that we find out the threshold without sensing is much smaller than the threshold with sensing. So how to understand that part? Well, again, recall our uh, restaurant booking example. Right? We know that whether to make a reservation largely depends on how long each customer stays in the restaurant. Um, but here, there is another important factor. Right? That's the capacity of the restaurant. Right? How many customers can be simultaneously served in the restaurant. Well, for a large and a capacious one, um, it doesn't make any difference whether you uh, make a phone call or not uh, to book a table because there are plenty of them. But for a small restaurant, um, then there is a high chance that you probably cannot walk in without a reservation. So here for CSMA, okay, if no sense the channel, then the connection-free uh, throughput is already good enough okay, when the data packet transmission time is large. Okay? It's already pretty close to one. 
So in that case, the benefits brought by the connection establishment is quite marginal. But for Aloha, if nodes do not sense the channel, then the throughput without connection, the connection free one, is bounded by e2 minus one. And so there is much more room for the improvements if nodes do not sense the channel. And now let's see how to apply the analysis to our protocol system design, or more specifically for machine-to-machine -machine communications. Okay. Which one would we prefer, connection-based or connection-free? And recall we have this um, question list in the beginning of our talk. Okay. So for example, for Wi-Fi networks, um, it has two access mechanisms. We have this um, connection-free basic access and the connection-based uh, RTS-CTS access. So here to understand which one performs better for machine-to-machine -machine communications, okay, we can first of all calculate the, uh, um, all the key parameters, the data packet transmission time and the overhead time for a successful transmission and the field transmission um, for connection-free and the connect, um, basic access and uh, connection-based RTS-CTS access. Okay. And this is an example then we can obtain the maximum effective throughput with RTS-CTS, okay, the solid line, and without um, connection. Okay, that's uh, the basic access, the dash line. So again, we can characterize this uh, threshold of packet pin on here, okay, uh, which is a function of the data rate okay, uh, we use to transmit the data, data packet, and also the basic rate. Here, the basic rate is the, the rate used to transmit those overhead, uh, this uh, header and allotment, uh, those overhead uh, signaling parts. Okay. So here we can see that this threshold would increase as the data rate uh, increases, because that means um, the data transmission time is reduced. Okay? Or the basic rate decreases, that means it takes longer to transmit those overhead. Okay, so the overhead time would increase. And we can express it as a function of RB and RD, and these are the typical values. Okay. So we know that in practice, the threshold is set to 2 to 14, okay, so in our current systems. And from this figure, we can see that oh, it's, it's too small. Okay. It should be set to a much larger value especially when the data rate is large. Okay? And that is often the case in, in, in our current systems. And both for basic access and RTS, CTS access, we assume uh, that nodes sense the channel, right? Because it's based on CSMA. Now, if they do not sense the channel, we can still uh, adopt a similar frame structure okay? um, by doing some minor adjustments. And then we can obtain this threshold of packet pinonens without sensing. Well, again, it is a function of your data rates and the basic rates. Okay? But what's interesting here is that it can be negative okay? if RD is small or your basic rate is large. So what does that mean, a, a, a negative threshold? Okay? It means that no matter how small the packet pinonens is, for any packet payloadness. This RTS-CTS access, the connection-based one, can always outperform the basic access. So this is very different from the sensing-based case. Here we can more clearly see from this figure. So this is the threshold if you have sensing, okay, based on CSMA, then the threshold will be always larger than two to 13. And that is way much larger than the typical values of the packet pinonets of machine type devices. So that means this RTS CTS access will be rarely activated okay, for machine to machine communications. But if you do not have sense, okay, if nodes do not sense the channel, then the threshold would be much smaller. Okay. 
and for especially when the data rate is is no and you will see that in most cases your connection based rts cds access will be better so how about 5g networks okay. uh, we know that 5g networks adopt this uh, aloha based random access procedure um, as the lte networks and it has been long criticized for its low efficiency okay, because of this connection establishment right and so many have been arguing that we should use a connection free one okay, to replace it well this no efficiency of um, the random access procedure is indeed attributed by many many factors okay? and one of the most important uh, factors is this n optimized backup parameter setting so and our current parameter setting, um, the access efficiency or the narrow throughput will quickly uh, drop as the number of devices increases. But if they can be optimized, right, if they can be optimally tuned, then the maximum throughput can indeed remain constant regardless of how many um, uh, devices in the network. And also another important factor is this uh, uh, periodic random access slots. Um, we, we know that users can access, can send requests only at those random access slots, which appear periodically. Um, so if they, they fail, they have to wait until the next uh, access slot comes instead of try immediately. Okay. And both of them would uh, significantly affect the throughput performance. Okay. But here from our analysis, we know that if uh, it's probably designed to achieve this maximum effective throughput, then a ground-based one can indeed uh, outperform this ground-free one, okay, even when the data packiness is very small. Right, so what does that tell us about the access design for future networks? So we have known that it's crucially determined whether connection-based or connection-free one is good is crucially determined by whether nodes sense or not. If they sense the channel, then most likely you would um, choose connection-free access because um, it could uh, it would give you better performance. But if nodes do not sense the channel, okay, then the gain from the connection establishment would be much more significant okay. um, significant enough to cover the cost of connection establishment and in general we have this um criterion for um aloha so if nodes do not sense the channel then the connection establishment threshold is always non-positive okay. uh, if and only if this inequality holds. So here, the left hand side is the overhead parameter okay, for a successful transmission and failed transmission of the connection based one. Okay. And on the right hand side is the overhead parameter for the connection free one. So we know that for successful transmission, then the overhead time for connection base will be larger than uh, the connection free one right, because of this connection establishment. But on the other hand, this overhead for failed transmission right, could be much smaller than the start SP because that SP has to contain uh, the header of the data packet, which is usually much, uh, very time consuming. So this criterion tells us that, um, well, if no student access the channel, um, then this connection-based access can indeed outperform a connection-free one, well, specific in terms of the maximum effective throughput for any packet panel NAS, right? because here the threshold is, is non positive. So for any packet panel NAS, the connection-based one will be better right, than connection-free one if their overhead parameters satisfy this inequality. But there are caveats okay, uh, when we apply these results. Okay, so we know that the access performance is critically determined 
by your receiver design and your channel models. Okay. And with more intelligent space station design than the uh, collisions, sorry, the, the access failures caused by the multi-user competition can be greatly reduced. And then, well, the benefit of connection establishment could be much weakened. And also, we know that by shifting <clears throat> to this uh, millimeter waves and with all this new antenna technologies, um, this channel models have been undergoing great uh, challenges recently. So we need to better understand how these new channel models uh, would affect the random access performance. And also for machine to machine communications, we know that they have quite stringent uh, latency requirements, especially for URLC. Uh, ultra -low, reliable low latency applications. And they also have special conditions, uh, constraints on energy consumption. So by taking into the constraint, uh, consideration of all these practical constraints on latency and energy consumption, then our analysis can provide more useful guidance for practical system design um, for our next generation communications. All right, so this is a collaborative work with my former PhD students who are now professors themselves. Um, so I would like to thank them. Um, and uh, everything, all the information can be found on uh, my homepage. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, comments, um, I would appreciate it a lot uh, if you, you can send them to me. Um, and this is my email address. Okay, with that, I'm going to end my talk. Um, thank you very much for this online. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lin Dai, for that presentation. And of course, uh, we'll now move on to the Q&A. I believe there have been some questions uh, streaming in as you are presenting all of that. And the first question, uh, Prof, comes from Sharif Hashima. And the question is, how can machine learning help the RAN configuration of M2M networks? Uh, machine learning, okay. Um, I guess um, this question have been asked for many speakers uh, in this workshop. Um, so basically, I, I think my opinion is pretty much in line with uh, the previous speakers. Uh, that is, uh, we, we need to understand how things work, okay? um, not just um, to know that it works. We need to know why it works. Um, so that is why um, I, I prefer this modeling approach um, so, so that we, we uh, can understand how to characterize the performance limits and also how to achieve those performance limits. Okay? But of course, machine learning is very, very useful. Okay? And I think it can be definitely used uh, for those dynamic conditions that we do not have good models. For example, for a completely unknown environment um, that we do not even know what the channel model is uh, or what the environment is, then we can definitely try to first of all learn the environment and in the meanwhile, apply all these useful machine learning techniques uh, to, to optimize or at least try to improve the access performance. Okay. So there are indeed many um, uh, studies uh, on machine learning techniques, uh, you know, applying the machine learning techniques to random access. Because in later, um, for random access, every user has to determine uh, what to do by themselves, right? Because nobody um, uh, would tell them uh, what to do. So that's basically a learning process, right? You, you, you observe the environment, and then you try to tune your parameters so that the performance can be better. So this can be indeed regarded as a learning process. But if you have powerful models, then we can better understand how to, um, you know, learn the environment in the best way. Okay? So, so in that sense, I guess they, they are not contradictory to each other. They, they can be good friends. Thank you so much for that explanation. And, you know, we have another question, a prof from the same uh, participant. This is again from uh, Sharif Hashima. And the question is, does connection-based consider blockage and panel properties, does it? Uh, sorry, uh, what is the blockage? 
Okay, the question is, does connection-based consider blockage and panel properties? Uh, okay, I, I'm not quite sure what um, blockage means uh, here. Okay. Because there, it can, can mean a lot of things. It can be physical blockage, right? That's uh, mm -hmm. in the physical, physical layer. Uh, or it can be, say, you, you have a lot of uh, uh, incoming requests and they are blocked. Um, so, so I'm not sure in which level here blockage means. Okay, maybe we'll ask uh, Sharif if you are watching right now. Uh, you saw Prof's uh, 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 questions for clarification. So if you can just clarify uh, your question a little bit based on what Prof just said, that will be most appreciated. In the meantime, we'll move on to the next question. And this is from uh, K3, K3, uh, K3P. Right, and K3P says, what will be the impact of the packet arrival rate in the overall performance of the network with respect to random access in M2M? What could it be? Oh, oh, great question. Oh, very good question. Um, so here, um, yeah, it, it indeed has a, a great uh, significant effect on the access performance. Okay, um, here in this talk, I only cover this throughput performance. Okay, uh, and for throughput performance, to to maximize the throughput, we have to first of all push the input to to the limits. Okay, so that is why in the final result, you didn't see the traffic input um, in the equation right? because it's already been pushed to the limits. But if we consider the delay performance, for example. We, we evaluate uh, the latency of uh, each packet, then the traffic input rate would definitely play an important role okay, in the comparison. And use our restaurant booking example, for example, um, I, I, I con continuously use it. Say um, it will make a big difference if you, you, you make a reservation uh, when in the peak hour or, you know, um, when the restaurant has no customers, right? So if the traffic input rate is low, then intuitively probably doesn't matter okay, whether you make a connection, uh, probably do not need to make a connection. Okay, but if the traffic input rate is very high, uh, a lot of people are competing with each other, then in that case, um, it's better to establish a connection to reduce the delay. Okay? Uh, so this is exactly what we are uh, studying right now. Okay? Uh, my PhD students are, uh, hard, hardly on this topic. So this is very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would like to share with you uh, about more recent results later on. Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, uh, the previous question uh, asked by Sharif uh, Hashima, now, they've, uh, now he's uh, actually been able to expand that. And it says, uh, so the question was, does connection based consider blockage and channel properties? And this is in regard to uh, transmitter and receiver blockage if the channel between TX and RX is blocked during the connection setup. I see, I see. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, now it's very clear. Um, yes, so, so this is about the physical channel model, right? Um, in the analysis, um, here we, we do not consider um, those, uh, you know, the physical blockage or, or you know, any interruptions due to the, 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 the channel fadings. Um, well, in, in this comparison, we did not uh, consider it. But in our other papers, um, so we do we did consider fading channels, right? So that the channel sometimes is good, sometimes is bad, right? So with all this randomness, then how it would affect your um, final, uh, you, the access performance, say the maximum throughput or the delay. So, so uh, if you are interested, um, you can definitely read more uh, from my papers with my student uh, Li Yi Tong. Okay. So, so in, in those papers, we, we did consider uh, those more practical channel models. Um, but what we didn't consider is that, uh, as I mentioned in the conclusion part, there are so many changes in the physical layer nowadays. Right? Um, if we, for example, later on have millimeter waves, uh, with all these new antenna technologies, then the channel models will be different from our traditional uh, fading channel models. So in, in that case, then we, we need to further uh, evaluate uh, the effects of these new channel models on the access performance. Thank you so much. Hopefully that uh, answered the question.
We have another question this time from uh, Ray Ching. And uh, Ray Ching says, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, in the model, a steady state probability is assumed. However, for M to M application, the arrival may be bursty and the steady state may not exist. The number of contending users may also be changed with time due to retransmission and back off. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's again a very good question. Um, yes, of course, with random access, you always have all these dynamics, right? The, the number of contending users would always change with time. As, uh, uh, that's a factor we have to deal with. Uh, and also the traffic input rate can be changing, uh, can be changed. Um, and you also mentioned this burstiness, which is a, a very good point that uh, um, sometimes you have a lot of packets uh, uh, incoming and sometimes you do not have any packets. Uh, for a long, long time. So um, one of the fundamental assumptions in, in the analysis indeed that the, the input process is stationary. Okay? So that's indeed a, a fundamental uh, assumption. Um, but we do have simulations. Okay? We did simulations uh, to find out if the input traffic has certain burstiness. Okay? And then we find out that indeed the analysis still can still be applied. Okay? So, so the reason, uh, one of the, the intuitive reasons is that even though you have this burstiness of input traffic, okay, but because we tune uh, the transmission probabilities, okay, and the tuning of the transmission probabilities can be regarded as randomizing the input traffic, okay, so that even though you have traffic um, coming in burstiness, but when you send them, okay, then the burstiness is gone. Okay, because of our optimal tuning of the transmission probabilities. And, and then you will see that by applying the analysis, you still have this very good match. Okay. Um, so if you are interested, you can definitely read my paper uh, with my student, student Jan Wen. Okay. Uh, it was published uh, you know, a few years ago, three years ago, about LTE networks. Okay. And uh, about the time varying um, traffic status, you always have uh, users, you know, um, different number of users contending, um, that, that's not a problem. Okay? Um, here, uh, one of the um, uh, key points that I'm trying to make here is that um, as long as your objective, okay, your objective is uh, long-term statistics, such as throughput, delay, right, is only about the steady state network performance. So as long as your objective is about steady state performance, then the tuning can also be based on statistical information. Okay? It, you, you, you do not need to worry about all this time varying network status. It will be fine okay? because your objective is only about the long-term performance. It's not about short-term performance. Okay? So that I hope that explains your, your, your Great. question. Yeah. Great explanation. And uh, the questions are still coming in. We have another question now from uh, PG Patil. And the question is, very interesting and potential to cover more machines to use available networks. Where is the intelligence to um, execute located? For example, is it near the nodes, sending machine, or near receiver, or aggregator? Okay, well, I, I, I'm really excited to have all these great questions. Um, yes, uh, again, um, so this is one of the, 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 the things that I, I didn't cover in my talk, but uh, has been an issue I'm, I'm thinking for a long, long time. So we are talking about all this about intelligence, right? But whether the intelligence should be at the base station, right? Or it should be at the, the, the device level. So I guess there have been a lot of debates, but uh, my personal view is that uh, the intelligence, uh, uh, again, my personal view is that should be at the base station, okay? um, the receiver level. And the reason is that uh, we know that the device usually has this uh, energy constraints. Okay? They are usually battery driven. And it's also not easy for them to observe the whole environment. Okay? But for the base station, okay, um, it has no battery problem, and it can collect information from the whole network. So that gives the base stations uh, this is internal advantage uh, of you know uh, of more intelligence, and they, it can do more um, control. 
currently. But it doesn't mean that it would like the centralized access. Um, the base station does not tell the users when to access. It's not in that way. Okay? But it can definitely collect information and then find out, for example, what is the optimal transmission probability for each node. Right? And then you can broadcast this optimal value to the whole network. And then for each device, after it receives this updated um, optimal transmission probability, then it can still independently determine when to access the network. So, so it will be interesting, right? The, the base station get more intelligent and it can you know, do more optimization, but still the whole network is totally distributed. Right? Um, so, so that's indeed what we, uh, we are trying to, 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 to work towards uh, the future direction. All right, wonderful. I think we still have two more questions uh, from our audience that we'd love to uh, answer. The next one for you, uh, Prof, is a question from Rahul Mishra. And the question is, is there any change in random access preamble format in M2M communications in case of both connection-based and connection-free procedure? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so this is this is interesting. Um, I didn't think about that, but uh, I, I think this is definitely possible that you have this network um, that connection-based and connection-free access would coexist. Right? So for some users, um, probably connection-based access is better, and for some users, connection-free access is better. Then the base station would, uh, you know, do this. Uh, optimization and see who should establish the connection first. Um, the, yeah, this is definitely possible, um, but we haven't been looking at it, uh, but this is uh, definitely one of the possible um, future directions uh, that we would pay attention to. Yeah, thank you very much for this advice. Great, and uh, I think we just have enough time for one more question from an audience member. This is uh, from Brinda S, all right, and Brinda S asks, what range of frequency band is considered under MM wave communication? Kindly elaborate. Oh, well, this depends on what system, communication system you are using. Okay? Currently, many communication systems support machine to machine communications. Right? As I mentioned, two examples uh, this Wi Fi and also cellular networks. Right? Um, so they, they, they have different frequency bands. And we also have other uh, standards, for example, LoRa, um, you know, um, uh, for those uh, uh, wide area networks uh, standard to support this uh, machine to machine communications. Um, but I think many of them, okay, many of them uh, would focus on this unlicensed spectrum. Okay? And for unlicensed spectrum, there are two uh, Junks, uh, one is uh, around 2.4 gigahertz, another is around five gigahertz. Okay? Um, so the reason that they, 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 many of them, they, they focus on the unlicensed spectrum is uh, you can see because they are, you don't need to pay for them. Okay? So um, uh, currently uh, I think it's also a very important uh, research topic that if you have all these different uh, systems, not just a single one, but many independent systems working on the same spectrum, the, some unnecessary spectrum because everybody can use it, and then they would interview with each other. Right? So, so in, in, in this scenario, so how they would affect each other's access performance. So this is also one of our current research uh, topics, uh, is that if, for example, you have both Wi-Fi networks and LTE networks, um, they both use um, kind of random access uh, schemes. And then they both work under this uh, analysis spectrum, then how to characterize their performance and to find the best way for them to coexist. Okay? So for what is the optimal transmission probability, for example, for each system, so that not only they can coexist, but uh, they can you know, even enhance each other's performance. So this is uh, also a very interesting topic. Um, yeah, this, this is uh, uh, one of our uh, papers published last year. So if you are interested, you can definitely take a look at it. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Linda. And I'm sure many members of our audience will be uh, looking up some of the uh, papers that you've published before. Of course, thank you so much for that very interesting uh, presentation and helping to answer all the questions from our audience as well. Thank you once again, Professor. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoy it. Thank you.